Welcome to yet another edition of the Two Deep NFL Podcast. With you as always, Jeff Chidea from the NFL Network, Eric Eager from Super Sports. I'm Soren Petro from Sports Radio 810 WHB in Kansas City. Much to cover the quarterbacks. Uh, it's time to start drafting them. We're just a little over a week away from the draft. Which one of the first-round quarterbacks or potential first-round quarterbacks, don't say that around Eric, you'll get upset if you say too many of them are going in the first round. Which one of them? Uh, is a bust. We'll talk about that. Should the Giants draft a quarterback in the first round? Uh, does the uh, draft signal a shift to offense being dominant uh, when it comes to the draft in years to come? Eagles signed Devontae Smith, CeeDee Lamb, and Micah Parsons do not show up. Neither does Justin Jefferson. TJ Hawkinson wants to now ban low hits uh, because of the injury he sustained. And OJ Simpson passed away. We talk about it all right now on the Two Deep NFL Podcast. You're listening to the Too Deep Podcast, the most complete analysis of the National Football League, breaking down the NFL like no one else can. Too Deep is hosted by Jeff Chidea, Eric Eager, and Soren Petro. Jeff Chidea is a senior columnist and on-air personality for the NFL Network and NFL.com. Eric Eager is the vice president of research and development for Sumer Sports. Soren Petro was the afternoon drive host of the program on Sports Radio 810 WHB in Kansas City. Too Deep is proudly brought to you by Gan Asphalt and Concrete, Kansas City's nationally recognized full-service paving and pavement maintenance contractor, making parking lot problems disappear since 1994. Free consultations, no commissions, in-house crews, and every project comes with a written warranty. Find them online at ganasphalt.com or call 816-484-3338. Gan Asphalt and Concrete, one contractor, all things parking lot. Now, here are the hosts of the Two Deep Football Podcast, Jeff Chidea, Eric Eager, and Soren Petro. And thank you very much, Curtis. Off and running here on another edition of the Two Deep Podcast. Uh, let's start with the quarterbacks, gentlemen. Uh, how about it? Uh, you got a guy, Eric, Caleb Williams, Drake May, Jaden Daniels. Who, who do you think? Like Penix, Onyx? Who's the guy that buyer beware? Um, McCarthy's the one where I don't want to be unfair to him. I think he's going to go like 11. Tread so, lightly. Yeah. <laughs> if he goes 11, that's fine. If Quasey somehow figures out how to deep, deep all of these teams into thinking he's trading up and then he gets McCarthy at 11, McCarthy will be fine because that's a great supporting cast and everything. If the team that trades up for McCarthy at four or three or two deserves whatever happens to them. I, I, I So that's my thing. I think McCarthy is a good top 15 prospect. I don't think he's good top five. So that's like my sliding scale. Jaden Daniels, I think if the team that drafts him understands what Justin Fields' team didn't understand, which is that everything is good except the sack avoidance, he's like Randall Cunningham, then – He'll be fine. I think Drake May is going to be good no matter what. I think Caleb Williams is going to be good no matter what. So that's kind of like my thing. I think Daniels has bust potential. I think McCarthy has bust potential. Obviously, Williams and, and May have bust potential. But I think like those two have less than the other two. So you have the Giants passing on McCarthy at six. I mean, if, they, if you get Malik Neighbors there... Or Roma Dunza. Okay. We have that question. We have that question coming later. I'm just curious about that. Like, because because they have 40 million wrapped up. I mean, I know that they can get out from under him next year, so I get that. But Mc, the Giants aren't exactly the McCarthy goes to this team and they're so loaded he can have success team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, I, I think Drake May has the highest bus potential. I'm not ever crazy about quarterbacks who don't play well in their last season before going into college. I know it's happened before. People always talk about Dan Marino was like the, the epitome of the guy who didn't do great um, in his last year and ended up blowing it up in the NFL. I, and I also feel Josh like Allen, Jordan Love, Justin Herbert, like I think uh, Brock Purdy, it's been like a pretty big regularity lately that you kind of have Young quarterback gets Josh Downs drafted. He leaves. Young quarterback struggles when all those guys leave town. 
that's kind of what ha isn't. But anyway, like that. that yeah. I feel like that's the narrative around. Yeah. Him. Well, with with Allen, I would say he wasn't that phenomenal in his year before he before his last year there. He wasn't great. Obviously, he declined a little bit, but he was always going to be a raw prospect. The other guys you mentioned were, were supposed to sit for a while, <laughs> right? I mean, Jordan right. Love sat for three years, and Justin Herbert was going to sit for a year in in, in, uh, in, in San Diego back then before. Tyrod Taylor got hurt. So I think that's got to be the thing with Drake, with Drake May that scares me. Someone's going to pop him in there and expect him to be a franchise quarterback. And so that's – I think that's always a dangerous thing. And I also feel like North Carolina quarterbacks, the, yeah, the, the word's out on them too. The sample size suggests you're not going to get a phenomenal player. <laughs> See Sam Howell, see Mitchell Trubisky. So um, if I'm picking one guy to be the bust, it would be Drake May. I'm curious of this. If a guy's worthy at quarterback, of pick 11, what's the likelihood he wasn't good enough to go three or four? Well, I think Quasi at Apple Mensa like really spelled it out really well. It's like, and there's an article that I wrote for Sumer Sports. It's actually, I think, gets at this. It's like, there are two types of quarterbacks. There, there are the guys who you throw out there right away, and they're the guys that you sit right away. And generally speaking, regardless of the folklore around the NFL, like, there isn't really that a benefit to sitting guys right away. And the reason is, is the guys that sit right away suck compared to the guys that play right away. You know, the only, the only guy who was picked after pick 12, the last like 10 years that has started right away is Mac Jones, right? Most of those guys. So my thing is, you know, Quasi yeah, said it first. Dak played from game one. Yeah. Long after, but what I'm saying is, in for, in the first round, like Dak played on accident. You know, like Mac beat out Cam Newton and one, and but like, but I'm talking about first round guys. So look at first round guys. They, you know, Quasi said it, it's like there are some guys who can overcome a deficiency, and you trade up for those guys, and there are guys that can't, and if they fall to you, and you don't have to give up assets, the assets that you're going to build around him with. Then you take him, and I and I do think that the the curve is pretty steep. I mean, the difference between and I know we we were Chiefs fans, Jeff too. Uh, you know, we won't admit it. I'm just kidding. But like the um, I like him. and we see Mahomes has gone at ten, and Deshaun Watson's gone at twelve. But for the most part, the good quarterbacks get taken early, and the Dwayne Haskins, those kind of guys get taken fifteenth, and Paxton Lynch gets taken twenty three. And Drew Locke gets taken 40. And like there is like a deep drop off, right? And and especially in perception. I, I guess I, I think that's listen, you know, Russell Wilson in the third, Tom Brady in the sixth, Tom Brady sat. I, I get your point. I, I do get the nuance of your point. If you're good enough to be thought of as a first round quarterback and go that high, but not good enough to play right away. Really, I mean, I think it's almost like you shouldn't go in the first. But as you pointed out a number of weeks ago, when I said, well, they're getting better at drafting quarterbacks, you said, you know, there's more starting quarterbacks that are first rounders. You said, no, they're just pushing them all up into the first. Well, that was what Bill Polian said on yeah. our show last yeah. week. Yes. I mean, he's, yes. he, he said the same thing. And I think and I think that's a great point. But I, I, I do think you're on to something because I always kind of felt like if, if you were if you were a quarterback that went three, like, why are you taking them three? If a guy's not good enough to go 1-1, one, one, it's because he's got warts. But then we see Donovan McNabb be the best one of the bunch going two out of a 1-2-3 scenario. So, I mean, I think I think just the idea you – know, Stroud you get, last year. You, you get a quarterback. You, you like him. There's multiple ones that you like. And you don't really know until they get under NFL fire. Like well, was, Nobody yeah, was convinced that the industry was not convinced Patrick Mahomes was going to be this good. And nor were the Chiefs, or as I have stated many times, they would have played him and should have played him in the playoffs his rookie year, should have played him. Al in the Michaels game. and Chris Collins were thought he was playing week one of 2017. You could ask George, wow. and you know, when they were preparing for that, for that, like Bill Belichick thought he was playing week one. Um, but you you bring up you bring up an interesting thing too. It's also the Jeff brought up Josh Allen, which I think is a good is a good point. There's there's the the there's the Mac Jonesness of the of the prospect, 
and the Trey Lanceness of the prospect as well. Whereas like Mac Jones, if Mac Jones would have started for the Niners the last three years, how many, how many Super Bowls do they make? The same amount, probably. Yeah. You know, yeah. versus you know, Trey Lance, they make you know, Trey Lance, their goal, the, their goal with drafting Trey Lance was to beat Patrick Mahomes in the Super Bowl, not to actually just get there, right? Like that when they saw what Mahomes did to them in 2019, they're like, We want this. We never come back for more than a touchdown in the fourth quarter. We need a quarterback that's real, and they didn't get it, and now they're still dealing with a lot of the same stuff. The I do think that like McCarthy, for example, if he stayed an extra year in college, is the first pick next year probably, right? And it's all almost all about maturity. The next Michigan coach is probably going to throw the ball a little bit more. Uh, there's going to be Donovan Edwards, Blake Corm are not going to be in the backfield, and he's going to be tested. And he, if he's like the blue chip player we think he can be at the ceiling, he will perform in those circumstances, answer all the questions we have about him, and he'll be first pick, right? And the reason that he's the fourth preferred player in this draft is not because his ceiling isn't as high as Caleb Williams, Drake May, Jaden Daniels. It's that we, it's that the uncertainty is much bigger. And so, like there, there's there's that gradient that it's not even just good or bad. It's literally Trey Lance, Mac Jones type, where like the medium project, like our projections at PFF at the time, same mean, but like the distribution for Lance was just like wider because we didn't know he had like 40 passes in his college career when trailing. We knew nothing about him, right? We know very little about JJ McCarthy relative to the other three guys and that's why it's a little bit different of a of a calculation jeff who's your bust drake may yeah there, I, I said may earlier for, for all the reasons i just mentioned north carolina well, I, I i disagree with eric on mccarthy just for this reason not because i'm a michigan fan i thought he was not going to be a first round pick when the season ended i thought he'd be early second or Michael Penix is at, or Bo Nix, and yeah. he's worked himself into it based off projection. But I will say there's something to be said for for winning intangibles, and I've seen this movie before with a Michigan quarterback. I'm not saying he's going to be Tom Brady, but the things that made Tom Brady special were the same things he showed it, in college. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not saying that. There's only one. He's one of one. But the scouts, when, they, when I talked to them about McCarthy and seeing him at his pro day, there is something to him. I would say that. Like when you are around him and he's a young guy, if you have a plan on how you want to develop him and you're seeing his strengths as intangibles, being coached by Jim Harbaugh, he's athletic. I think that's a much smarter play than saying, yeah, we're taking him and we're going to turn him into the next hot thing. I I, I think he understands himself well enough. It, Playing at Michigan, for example, tells you what kind of quarterback he is. That he's not so concerned about his stats. He wants to win games. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I, I think that – I don't think he's getting past the top six. I think if the Giants are there and he's there, he's gone to New York. I think do, you think, do you think that he'll succeed? Like, do you think, Jeff, that he's the kind of quarterback to the point about what we're saying is – well, for one, here, like, let's back up the truck a little bit. How, is – it's 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 almost insane to say it this way in hindsight, but how much of Mahomes' otherworldly ceiling hitting outcome a factor of going with Andy? Like oh, I, I believe in my I believe in my mind that if Patrick went to the Bears, he'd still be successful. I think he's that good, but I don't believe that. I think that was like there, I, mean, I think that's a reasonable I think that's a reasonable charge. So is McCarthy, right, if McCarthy goes to the Giants and Dable is, doesn't have his fastball that he had two years ago with Daniel Jones, it can it, can he be successful? Or does he need to go? Because I think if he goes to I, – I think whichever quarterback had, lands in Minnesota is going to be good. I, I, it's just – it's going to be hard for that kid to fail. What about, what about McCarthy? Is he an impervious to circumstances or is he a – Depender on. Well, I, I think a smart around. team builds a team around him. So I think no matter where you go, if, if you're going in and saying he's got to be our Patrick Mahomes, I think you're going to be doomed to fail. I think if you go in and saying here's what he does well, 
let's go find some real receivers. Let's go. Let's keep building the offensive line. Let's keep building the defense. You know, I, I think I've always believed it. It's, I think it's true of Patrick. I think it's true of Josh Allen. I think it's true of Lamar Jackson, Joe Burrow to a certain extent. I think quarter, young quarterbacks who've succeeded in this era, the last five years, the one thing they all have in common is that the teams around them were smart and said, let's go get them some help. Let's go put some people around them. And let's build the offense to what they do well. Let's yeah. not be so consumed by he's great and he's going to be great on his own. Let's make sure they have everything they need to be successful. They did it with Patrick, did it with Lamar, did it with, with Burr. Bur- they could have went and got Panay Sewell in Cincinnati. They went and got Jamar Chase because they wanted to score points, put him with T. Higgins. I think Jaden Daniels is hurt. I, I think he takes too many hits and he doesn't get up from them. And I think that's a bigger problem than people realize. And if he slides, that's why. Um, I, I, RG3, I said going in, when everybody freaked out about him taking Kirk, uh, 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 Kirk um, Cousins in the same draft. I said, RG3 is going to be hurt. Did you see him at Baylor? He was hurt. There's an adage about pitching. You know what the biggest uh, indicator is that a pitcher will be hurt? If he's already been hurt. And I think that applies to quarterbacks. Like you stand back there and you take kill shots. And if you don't get up from him in college, you're sure as hell not getting up from him in the NFL. So that scares me. And I think he's being overdrafted. I like the player, but I voted for him for the Heisman Trophy. But I, I don't think he can go through the rigors of a 17-game NFL season year in, year out. So that's a problem. I think Drake May is being undervalued. Matt Ryan threw like 16 INTs last year. I mean, he, he kind of backed up a little bit. Still had a fine career. Do I think Drake May is going to be Tom Brady? No. But I think he'll be better than Mitchell Trubisky somewhere in between. I mean, I think, I don't, I, I think there's a window there for, for all these guys. Um, you know, I, I, the one thing I will say this, um, my, Penix looks funny when he throws the ball. Like there's something about the release. That's all I'll say. What does it mean? Can he, I don't know. <laughs> he threw to two NFL wide receivers, three NFL three. wide receivers. And it just, and I don't know if it's just cause he, he's left-handed, right? Yeah. I don't know if it's cause he's left-handed. So I'm seeing the ball come a different way, but it, it looks like there's this little hitch thing, right? And I remember when Tim Tebow was coming out, he'd, he'd throw the ball in college and it looked all right to me. But then everybody that, you know, they were all freaked out about how he throws the ball and nobody says anything about this, which means that maybe it's just I'm not used to seeing left-handed quarterbacks anymore. But it just looks funny. He, he was brilliant at Washington. Brilliant. I thought he was great in the championship game. He was tough as nails. Uh, I, he was great against Oregon, dropping dimes, throwing, you know, putting balls in there. But that just is kind of funny to me. And Bo Nix, to me, Bo Nix had a chance to beat Washington twice and didn't get it done. It's like yeah. the ceiling is Dak Prescott. Yeah, that's the ceiling, and mm-hmm. most people don't reach their ceiling. But he doesn't get it done when he's got to get it done. And and I'm not really, I, I don't know, I, I'm not sure why he jetted teams, you know. I don't get that. Why, I, the other man left Auburn? Yeah, the, his dad played at Auburn. How did that go wrong? Well, I have no yeah. idea. <laughs> Auburn's been a crap program for like yeah. 10 years, though, right? That's true. That's true. It's a fair point. Um, all right, uh, so do the Giants. We talked a little bit about what would happen. Do they have to take a quarterback? Right, Jeff, do you believe that they have to move on yes. from Daniel Jones? Yeah, I do. I mean, I, I know that. There's people out there who will argue that Daniel Jones, hey, it's a fair argument. He hasn't had the kind of help that other young quarterbacks have had at the offensive line, at receiver, but he's been hurt. He's been there long enough. And at some point, you start playing this game, the same game they're playing in Dallas now, where you start getting a quarterback who is who you like, but you're starting to pay him more and more money, and it's affecting your ability to go out and build a better team around them. I, if I'm the Giants, I'm much happier with the idea of restarting the clock with a younger quarterback. Have it, you got a quarterback, Daniel Jones, there to play this year, apprentice season for a guy at McCarthy, and you go out, they'll find receivers in the second round, and you start rebuilding again. If you don't, I mean, you're going to be chasing the Eagles. You'll be chasing the Cowboys. you got to find a way to start making a move up the ladder in that division as opposed to constantly being – 
third or fourth best. And so, yeah, it's I feel for Daniel Jones because I think people didn't really love him coming into New York. But I also feel like you he's been there long enough for you to know either we give him a big deal and he's our franchise guy or we cut bait. Eric, what do you think? They got to go that way? If the right guy is there, I just – do. yeah, if McCarthy lands at six to them, I think it, they should probably take him. Um, I think the real question is should they trade up to three to get Drake May or Jaden Daniels? I think the question is, first of all, are, are you done with Daniel Jones? I yeah. am. <laughs> I am. Yeah. Are they? I mean, when I saw – how does this happen in the NFL, by the way? Nagy goes to Chicago – he gets Trubisky to 12 and four one year, dazzles. The next year, he's like quiet quitting because he's pissed off that Mitch, Mitch Trubisky is still the quarterback, right? Brian Dable goes to New York, gets Daniel Jones to the second round of the playoffs. Was there a more miserable head coach in the NFL last year than Brian Dable? Like, why do these coaches take these jobs, miracle work with these quarterbacks, and then give up on them? Right. Like, I, that's what I like. Even McVay, to an extent, like, could not say enough stuff about Jared Goff on the way out. Like, so yes, they're done with him. Yeah. I, I never, I saw a guy last year on the sideline that wanted to punt that dude into the stands. So yeah, they're done with him. Whether that means they go get Dak Prescott next year or draft a quarterback now remains to be seen. But I do think that for the right price, they will take one. Gan Asshole and Concrete is celebrating 30 years of business with free consultations, no commissions, in-house crews. Every project comes with a written warning. Gan Asshole keeps your parking lot safer, helps you and your business avoid unnecessary delays and costly expenses, plus makes a great first and last impression. Find them online at ganassault.com. Call 816-484-3338. Gan Asshole and Concrete, one contractor, all things parking lot. Eric, I want to ask you specifically because you're always a proponent of Try the next young guy. Get another one. Get two of them if you need be. Invest in the quarterback until you figure it out. So then Minnesota, Denver, and Vegas all should take quarterbacks. Atlanta should take a quarterback. Okay. But all these teams. All of them. No matter See, that's what I'm saying. Like this is no matter how far why, down, no matter how far down you go. I, that's where the question is, right? Because if you're Denver, you can probably – so Denver's the favorite, for example, to draft Bo Nix. Now, Bo Nix's draft – Bo Nix's draft uh, prop at Circa Sports, awesome sports book, 32 and a half. So is that Denver's second pick or Denver's first pick, right? Because that's where I, I get – I think for the first four guys, take them in the first round. I think for the last – for the, the – you know – and I put Rattler actually with Knicks and Penix for what it's worth. For those three, take them in the second round. Like, I think if you, like, it's Christian Ponder as hell if you take Bo Nix at 12. So there is a scenario where those teams can come through the draft and say, well, you know, we didn't think that he was first round. We waited until the second round. He goes before him. And so they just go back with what they got. It's not like you have to get a quarterback no matter what. Take him in the first round. Take whoever the best one is. And and let's get to moving forward. Denver's not winning anything this year. Like let's let's be adults here. So like whether or not they get a guy in the room is not an issue. Like that one's they can wait on it. He's got a ten year deal. They have the Walton money. They're paying off the Wilson stuff right now. Like that's that that one. I don't think they have to be desperate at all. I think Vegas needs a quarterback. But they also talk up Aiden O'Connell and Gardner Minshew like they're a thing, right? So uh, I think defensive coaches – this is a, a study Dimitrov had me do because he was one of them. Defensive coaches who draft a quarterback with their first pick of their tenure, the success rate is like half of that of a normal first-round pick. So Antonio Pierce, I just don't think it will happen. Um, and then – Minnesota, Atlanta, New York should why, all be. Why, why, why should Atlanta be drafting a quarterback? I don't understand. Why should Atlanta be drafting a quarterback? Because Kirk Cousins is 36 years old coming off an Achilles. And his contract is effectively a two-year deal. So at some point, you got to be thinking about getting a young guy in there. But you're talking about a guy who would be 
a second, third, fourth round, a second day, third day pick, right? I mean, a Jordan Love type. I mean, J.J. McCarthy, in, in hindsight, do the Packers care that they got Jordan Love at 26 or 8? Well, no. And, and, well, and I, <laughs> I, I was told that about the trade-up uh, for Patrick Mahomes. Like, hey, some people say you gave up too much, and, and some people told me if we're right, no one will ever even remember what we traded. Right. So it is about getting it right. I'm with you on that. That was kind of my point. How is JJ McCarthy a bad move at six, but he's okay at 11, right? Like he's a bad move at four, but he's okay at 11. That's kind of my point. If he's good enough to be a guy that is your franchise starting quarterback, maybe he's not, you know, well, maybe, not maybe this, but let me sorry, finish. Maybe. If he's good enough to do that, you know, to me, it seems like there's, it's kind of a sliding scale. Yeah. I, okay. To be good at four. If it's all about, you know, you find your guy, take him. Let's go. Well, so right? maybe maybe I maybe I'm I'm uh, I should explain what I said better. If you're at four and McCarthy falls to you, probably okay. If you're Quasi Adopel Menson, you're trading up to four. I think it's a different thing that like I would trade if I were him. I would trade up to two for Daniels. I would trade up to two for May or, th or three for May or vice versa, depending upon where the market shakes out, I would not trade up to four for McCarthy. I think those two guys are worth 23-11 next year's one. I think McCarthy is worth this year's 11. That's the difference I see. So, like, I think it is a little bit different, right? I, I still don't get the Atlanta part of it. So you're saying Atlanta at eight, if they took a quarterback, it would make sense. I don't – that makes no sense to me. If you're a team that's trying, you spent the last three years spending, spending first round picks on skill position players. You're trying to build yourself into a playoff team. You're saying we just spent a hundred million dollars on Kirk Cousins, and we're taking a quarterback in the first round too. I mean, like I said, they're not going to do it, but I would do it. I would. <laughs> and, and like we've had, I've had this conversation Which before, though. Like yeah. I don't actually think the Cousins signing is bad. And if I was in that seat, I might have considered it as well. But you do have to consider, like the Vikings got themselves into all of this, which is, again, you did a competitive re – I hate to rant about this, but you got yourself into a competitive rebuild because you had Cousins and no backup plan. During two years, the Bears have got a war chest and are about to draft the best quarterback prospect since Mahomes, you know, or the best prospect since Luck, but, you know, a very good prospect. Detroit and, Ch and Green Bay have won three more playoff games than you during your competitive part of the competitive rebuild. And that only happened because you had no one who you held held over Cousins. So he kept taking you to the woodshed on a contract. So, yeah, I would draft a quarterback. And if and if Kirk plays awesome, great. No one's going to care that I gave up a first-round pick here. And if he and doesn't – care about the $100 million. <laughs> gave him. <laughs> I, I don't know. If you're the Falcons – you haven't won more than seven games in a season since 2017. Like Kirk was brought to that team to win eight, nine, ten games, not to win the Super Bowl. Like, well, and I, and I think that's the point. I think it does matter where you are as a franchise because listen, if you have a quarterback that you feel resolute about, if they're sitting there at eight and they have a passion for a quarterback the way the Chiefs had a passion for Patrick Mahomes, then go by all means do it. And you might not even be right. Like, I, I don't think there was anything wrong with what the Chiefs did, even if he ended up being Mitchell Trubisky. Yes. They had Alex Smith. So from that standpoint, I, I get it. But the idea that, like, you know, you don't like, you don't like, Pen you don't like Bo Nix, right? You don't like Penix. So who would be the guy you would take at eight? McCarthy, if he fell. What if he doesn't fall? Yeah. Well, then I'd take Dallas Turner or whoever the heck they're going to take, okay. right? Like, <laughs> yeah, I, just wanted to I, mean, be clear. I just wanted to be clear that you're not saying take, take the next best quarterback. No, I'm saying if a quarterback's good enough, take him. If he's not, don't. But like, but there are teams like if a could if a quarterback's good enough at 32, the Chiefs aren't taking him. There's a difference. There are there are levels here. So like that that that's sort of more of what I'm saying is Kirk Cousins isn't the kind of quarterback, and he had never has been the kind of quarterback yeah. where if a guy came across your table and he was good enough and blue chip enough that you wouldn't take him. And that that's my issue with the Falcons. Yeah, don't take Bo Nix at eight, but take JJ McCarthy at eight. I, I think I think the message is, you know, until you have one of a handful of guys, your head is on a swivel. Always. Always. 
like the Chiefs had and the Bills had and the teams that have guys, the Baltimore, their head maybe gets on a swivel in round three or four, like, oh, where this guy graded bottom of the first round? He's here. Let's grab him. But I think your point, I, I think it's a fair point. I, I get what you're saying right now. Jeff, specifically, though, with Denver, Las Vegas, you know, would you be recommending quarterback where they are at this point in the draft? Or are they at the spot of what you talked about earlier? Build the team. And Eric has talked about this. Build the team. Build the skill position players. Get it ready for when you've got a shot to get one of the top two or three quarterbacks. I'm in the second camp. Build the team. Because really from where they're at, Denver and Vegas, I mean, my Minnesota has way more ammunition and is in a better position to make a move anyway. And so you're sitting there knowing that second round, we're probably going to be able to grab a Michael Penix, a Bo Nix, whoever, a Spencer Rattler. Let's just keep adding pieces. I mean, you're not going to not, – neither one of those teams realistically is going to be a player – in the you know a serious player in the playoff race, maybe they'll compete for a playoff spot for a wild card spot, but they're probably going to be around a seven, eight, nine win team at best. And so yeah, build your team out, take your lumps, but find a guy who works for you. You don't have to overreach that position. And if there gonna be a lot of teams looking to make deals, it's going to be a fascinating first day of the draft because so many teams are going to be in play, like. Minnesota, like Denver, like Vegas on that end of it, like Arizona, like the Giants. You know, there's going to be a lot of people making a move. Patriots can make a move. But I think, yeah, I think to fall in love with some of these guys and think you're going to get there and, and give up all this ammunition. I, I, do the Broncos even have enough to trade up? No. To be a serious trade? Yeah, they don't even have No, it. not really. I mean. So, yeah. so you know, why, why do that to yourself? Wait it out. Well, uh, especially because you don't even have cap space next year. Yeah. <laughs> A nationally recognized Gan Asphalt and Concrete is a full-service paving and pavement maintenance contractor. Parking lot problems, they've made them disappear since 1994. Don't risk accidents and liability in your lot. Get your parking lot restriped today at Brightly Striped Lot. Cut down on accidents and keep your lot as safe as possible. Plus, make a great impression with your clients, with your customers. Gan Asphalt and Concrete is online at ganasphalt.com. One contractor, all things parking lot, Gan Asphalt and Concrete. Uh, Eric, listen, um, when it, when it comes to this draft, there's going to be lots of offense, right? And I know drafts are cyclical. Sometimes it's a lot of defense. But should the draft start to be heavily weighted offensively? Is that where it's going? Yeah, so the draft the draft market says 21 and a half offensive players, um, which is crazy considering there are predicted to be no running backs and only one tight end. There's no safeties and no linebackers uh, projected to go in the first round. Um but no, I, it, it's cyclical, right? Like we remember a couple of years ago when the betting market was six and a half offensive linemen in round one, and I think only four or five went. Uh, so sometimes they underachieved their wide receiver to 2022. The market number was six and a half. It got to six by pick 18. And then none of them left after that. So it, it's, it's, it's pretty much just like, you know, some years there are a lot of corners. This year you don't have a lot of corners. So yeah, but I get that. But, but I get that, but, like, we, listen, like we talked about, it. there are going to be, like, nine offensive tackles. But I don't think that that's, I don't think that that's a, a strategic thing. Like, there are premium positions on the defensive side well, of the ball. That, But that's what I'm talking about. But premium positions get pushed forward. And what I'm, I guess what I'm getting at is I'm not saying go draft a guard at nine. But should offense as a whole be the premium position? Because offense is winning championships now. So should all offense be pushed up? Are we seeing that? Like, are we seeing the fact that there's only two or three corners? Or, or is, I, I get the cyclical part, but should teams, as they push tackles up, should they be pushing up offense above defense? Uh, maybe, maybe. But I do know that, I mean, scoring is down in the NFL the last few years, and some of that might be the talent. There might just be more talent coming in. Um but, but yeah, I mean, offensive linemen, this has been a league that has had a hard time developing offensive linemen. So if more of them go in round one and they're given uh, more time, then that's obviously better for the game. So, yeah, I could see that. I, I Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's an interesting question. Okay, so I wanted to ask you to him first to get the analytic approach. Jeff, you love your defense. But is yeah. reality that offense wins championships now and teams should be pushing it up the board? Uh. I think that's – I don't think it's that simple. I mean, the Chiefs won a championship last year with an offense that wasn't 
performing at a high level, but it's because their defense played really well. And if you go back a couple of years ago, 2022 draft, I mean, the first five or six picks were, were defensive players, right? You had Trayvon Walker, you had Aiden Hutchinson, Sauce Gardner was in that draft, uh, the kid at Houston, the corner, we played LS, Derek Stingley was in that draft. So I think it depends on the talent available to you. I mean, really, what you're seeing, and why I say it's simple to say that, because you still need to have a great quarterback to win championships. And it's hard to find the great quarterback. So without that, you're going to have to have some other measure that allows you to compete. I mean, the Ravens have done it for a while. Uh, the Niners, obviously, they have done it for a while with their defense. The, the Rams, you know, Aaron Donald was a big factor in them winning the championship. You can say Matthew Stafford was the was was the was the key to it all, but Aaron Donald being there was a big factor as well. So I think you're still going to see teams try to build out defense because, again, you're going to be swinging and misses. At, you're going to be more swings and misses at quarterback moving forward, just as there were for the last five or six years. I mean, how many quarterbacks in the last five or six years who were taking the first round are still playing with their original team? That's like an obscene number. And so you have to offset that somehow. Uh, let's talk about the Eagles. Devontae Smith, three years, $75 million. They're already paying A.J. Brown. A lot of money. Um, Eric, was this a smart move? Uh, they they do void years, so it's not and and they did pick up his fifth year option, so it's cheaper, and so they're going to be able to get I think some cap relief down the line. Um, I think it's better than what the Jaguars did with Josh Allen, where it's like you wait till the franchise tag, you pay him six more million a year than Rashawn Gary because you misevaluated your own player and you weren't willing to give them a deal, you end up paying more. The Eagles almost always do the other side, which is once they get a read on a player that he's good enough to be an Eagle, they pay him at you know, probably too early in the case of Carson Wentz. For almost everybody else, it's been you know the way that they structure their contracts. Those guys end up being relatively inexpensive by the end of it. It does create an issue with what we saw with Hassan Reddick, where a guy gets a little bit older and you know his – because the way that they do deals, which is bonus pro rate, those guys' contracts become not very lucrative week for week at the end. And so then they've gotten in trouble lately of having to trade some of those players. But on the front end, it's a fine deal for the Eagles. You like the steal, Jeff? Yeah, for the same reasons. I mean, Eric's right. I'm surprised you haven't seen Andy Reid and Brett Feast do more of this in Kansas City. But it's that that was the hallmark. Of, of what they did back when Reed was there, which is signing guys, early deals, good money. I think that the number you saw there is not a, not a coincidence. They wanted to keep him at the same rate as A.J. Brown, so there's no jealousy there. But really, it's, it's a smart play to get ahead of the receiver market because a lot of guys that you're seeing this with C.D. Lamb, Justin Jefferson, uh, Jalen Waddle is going to be up here pretty soon. Uh, I'm on Ross St. Brown is, is coming up here. I mean, there's a lot of guys moving into that $30 million a year range and to be able to pay a guy like Devontae Smith, 25 million a year is certainly a, a nice deal. Nice discount. Well, and Jeff, you, I mean, as like, you've been in these locker rooms, you've, you've talked to these players, you played too. Like it's the Josh Allen thing is what I come back to. You misevaluate your own player. You get to the franchise tag, you yep. pay him. Yep. No one's happy. Right. Yep. You're not happy because you overpaid. He's not happy because you didn't value him right away. Yep. All these teams are really worried about overpaying. And I'm thinking to myself, that little extra that you are taking a chance on, A, if the players is if if you've evaluated your player properly, it's gonna be nothing. But yep. B, it's also like really important to some of these teams that they see their teammates rewarded for yep for being drafted and developed and, and being loyal to the team that like, that's what the Eagles I think are buying tan, uh, intangibly here. I wonder if this isn't a preemptive strike to moving on from AJ Brown. Could be. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's at least insurance. I mean, yeah. he, he's been kind of a pain in the ass. Yeah. And so if it gets worse, okay, this guy's locked in. We don't have nothing. No. Right. So listen, I I think it's a little pricey for Devontae Smith, but 
I, I think it's – they're all in to win now. This kind of takes me back to a little bit of the Falcons. I mean, I think organizations are in different spots, and they're trying to cash with this group in Philadelphia. The Falcons are trying to end years of futility. So the finish line is different for these teams. But I think it's a little bit of insurance for A.J. Brown popping off and becoming a pain in the ass. Uh, I really do. C.D. Lamb and Micah Parsons, not in camp, Jeff. Uh, what, what do we make of this? Uh, already a bunch of money in Dak Prescott. We're already talking about whether or not he's going to be back next year. The owners out there saying teams on the field. These are the guys. The money's spent. Yeah. Um, well, it's spent, but they ain't showing up. Yeah. So he either spends more money, or neither one of these guys are coming to camp. Right? Yeah. Well, and if Trayvon Diggs was healthy, he might be in the same boat. Right? I mean, they're all coming up at around the same time, which we knew was going to happen. I mean, it looks CD Lamb is going to get paid. First in all this, Mega Parsons is eligible. I'm sure they'll take care of him. The, the guy that becomes a lot more intriguing is Dak. And just as we talked about with Daniel Jones a little bit ago, I'm starting to come around to the idea that this probably is going to be the end of the road for Dak after this year if it doesn't end with a championship. Because you just the, the, the price is too high. The team is at a point now where they still have enough good young players to, to still still be formidable. But to be able to reset the clock with a younger quarterback and, and find some value in him elsewhere, exactly what happened with Kirk Cousins. It may be time for them to make that move after this year because they I, I don't see where it makes sense to go extend him again, give him a bunch of money, and keep getting the same results. And so that, to me, is the more intriguing question in Dallas. Is this the end of the road for, for, for Dak after this year? What do you think of uh, C.D. and Parsons? And let's tie Dak into it as well, Eric. Well, I, I don't think Jerry Jones did himself any favors by saying, you know, we're all in and then like not doing anything, right? Like there's, yeah. you know, the work dynamics there are not great because in essence, what you're telling Lamb and Parsons is we think you're worth what you're getting paid. Like that's that's like ultimately what that means. And so that's not good. Uh, Lamb was a top, what, five receiver last year, if not higher. I mean, he basically carried that whole offense for most of the season. He deserves, as Jeff said, a deal that's north of, of what Devontae Smith just got. Um, and, you know, Parsons is, you know, close, you know, Lawrence Taylor type of player, eventually in this NFL, I think. So, uh, and I think that Jerry maybe is looking at it and saying, like, the last few times we paid superstars here, it didn't work. And he's holding out on this and, and trying to make a, an informed decision. But back to what we just said about Josh Allen, Devontae Smith, like that doesn't, that doesn't bode well in the locker room. Well, and it's different scenarios, right? Parsons a year younger. He's yeah. looking to get paid after three years. CD's gone through the four. This is the time when you would normally pay CD Lamb. Yeah. I, I mean, that, that's what that's. Well, if you pay Parsons before Lamb, you're losing Lamb. Exactly. <laughs> right. Like you're just not, yeah. you're not, he's, he's going to say, you've chosen this player over me. There's no way they can expect a battle for a championship without CD Lamb. And I, I do wonder, is Micah Parsons see writing on the wall? He already had a conversation with uh, 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 Mike Zimmer. Oh, you got to get bigger. You got to lift. It's like, hey, man, I know my <laughs> all the hype was that. No. Zimmer wants bigger, more physical guys. You know, is is that, uh, you know, the, the prelude to forcing a trade? And if you're going to go down that road, he, you know, as great a player as he is, he doesn't fit the scheme. And as good of a coach as, as Mike Zimmer is, go back to his Vikings days, his Cincinnati days. There are not. Like, Anthony Barr w was drafted out of UCLA as an edge, played off-ball linebacker the whole time. They, like... Zimmer was a very good defensive mind who was uncreative with the positionless type players in Minnesota and in Cincinnati. So there are not linebacker defensive end type players. So yes, if he wants to play defensive end in Mike Zimmer's defense, he has to bulk up. This looks more like Everson Griffin and he's got to, and he's just going to have his hand in the grass. There's going to be none of that other stuff that he was doing uh, with Dan Quinn. And that might, he might be like, shoot, I don't want to play here anymore. I mean, doesn't it like it, it yeah. does everybody's it's a me, me, me. 
By the way, the only guy not saying me, me, me is Dak Prescott, although he did go me, me, me and get the contract behind closed doors, but he's not out front. But we, we hear a lot of guys out there. I mean, I, I don't know. Like, does kind of feel like maybe somebody doesn't make it to camp, right? Not just hold that, like, says, okay, yeah. trade. And would the Cowboys actually trade Micah Parsons? I think you got to see how it looks first, right? I mean, I know what Eric's saying, but it's, I mean, he have a, he'd have a lot of suitors if they wanted to do a trade with him. But I think the bigger problem here is what you're seeing with Dallas juxtaposed against Philadelphia with what they did with Devontae Smith is not understanding how this could all look down the road. Uh, they're smart people that obviously they, they run a great business and had success. But when you get in the locker rooms, especially in that kind of locker room in Dallas where everything is so high profile, you're talking about money like this. It's very hard to make everybody happy. And so that's that's really what's going to undermine them o- over the long run. And I don't understand, and we've seen this with Patrick Mahomes here, I don't understand Dak Prescott co- constantly wanting to have all the money coming to him. <laughs> like, if you want to win championships, you got to kind of set the table for everybody else, right? That's what the that's what Mahomes taught everybody else in this league about winning games, winning championships when you start to evolve and get deeper into your career. Like if Dak Prescott's not willing to do that, I think that's you're seeing all this these tweets going back and forth and people bitching and moaning about this and that. I guarantee you that's a big part of what this is, because he's holding up everybody else's ability to go eat. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh Justin Jefferson, no shows in Minnesota. We kind of expected this, Eric. So this isn't a giant deal, but I think it does. I mean, he's going to be the highest paid receiver. This to me seems like an easy one to get done. He's going to be the highest paid receiver. So why can't this one move really quickly? Like I, I know they're not worried about mini camps and stuff like that, but this is one that you ought to be able to get done without a training camp holdout, right? Well, and this is the one you get done after three years. Like, yeah. there's no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He was averaging ten yards a target. He was averaging like two and a half yards per out run. He's one of the most productive players to ever come in the league at wide receiver in a franchise that's had Hall of Fame wide receivers and you know Ring of Honor wide receivers up and down. He's been possibly the best to start a career. And so it, it makes no sense. And the longer it goes, the harder it's going to get. To Jeff, like to the whole point that we've made here, the price tag could have been a lot lower before. And I don't know what you were worried about other than, like we just said with Kirk Cousins, like his contract made things onerous. It would have been so. It should have been done for the Vikings to pay him early, so they could pay him less. Here's more money now. This is what we'll give you to take it now, not because it should have been done. Because you know, everybody should get a deal after. Well, it, it's it's not that he pays less, right? Like it, at the time, that money is worth what it's worth. It's the cap value of a dollar goes down. So it's not that we. We try to pay them, you know, that you try to pay the players early to screw them over. It's that it's good for everybody to get the money first, right? And at the time, you're the highest paid guy. Over time, that money becomes less a fraction of the cap, but the same size of money to the player. So, like, that's more of it. It's like get it done so that you can benefit from the expansion of the league. Yeah. And we also don't know how much, you know, they're trying to wade through a lot of different deals. I mean, Dalvin Cook was there, Den- Denel TJ Hunter, TJ Hawkinson. Harrison Smith had a really weird deal for an older player. I think he just took a pay cut. I mean, and Cousins. And so all that stuff probably is your as a gym, you're trying to figure out how can we make all this work again. It's I'm and I'm sure he's probably asking for the moon on top of it. So it's he's probably 35 million a year or some crazy number, 40 million, who knows? But, yeah, it's it should have been done earlier. Yeah, and he should have been prioritized earlier. He'd proven his worth. I think yeah. that's Eric's point. After three years, you didn't need to see any more. So you should have been – after two years, you didn't need to see any more. Yep. So you should have been clearing out whatever you needed to clear out to make him happy. I think that's the, uh, the, the bottom line. Uh, TJ Hawkinson wants the league to take a closer look at low hits, Jeff. Um, he got an ACL injury. I get it. Tyler Higby got one. What 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 is this like – you got to be able to tackle somebody somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I feel his pain. I understand where it's coming from, but this is what the league has created. I mean, if you're not going to go high, you got to go low. And not everybody's going to be hit right in the chest 
or around the hips, and it's it's not going to be pretty. You're talking about guys who are very physical, very aggressive, and trying to win games too. And so I'm sure defense players would say, well, if you don't like getting hit, don't run those routes. <laughs> don't, don't come across the middle in that way because we're going to come take you out one way or another. So I think it's sad. I, I think if you ask most players – and maybe it's, it's sad to say they'd probably take that they'd take the concussion over the ACL. I probably I probably would guess ninety percent would probably say we'll take the knee injury. Is there any traction here, Eric? I mean, they just outlawed the hip drop tackle, right? So that's there's going to be some of that. Um, Jeff's right though about the players, like hundred percent, like they would totally take the concussion. Uh, I just don't know what you're going to be able to do, right? Because it, that's the only way for a defensive back to tackle a tight end, really. Yeah. So, like, I don't know how how the game persists without it. Yeah. I, that's why I don't think it has any traction, I don't, especially right now coming in the wake of the hip tackle. I don't see it. I don't see it getting anywhere. Um, finally, uh, O.J. Simpson passed away. Reaction. What was your reaction, Jeff? Uh, I can finally stop hearing people complain about that verdict from my. <laughs> 30 years ago it's like it's the one case that lingered on and on i understand why it did but i think my reaction was oj in in a weird way is was the weirdest person to have such a huge cultural influence i mean you think about everything that came after him court tv fox news msnb all this 24-hour news cycle the kardashians you know it's just and he thought he, he, he that that trial was so much about celebrity and it was about money and it was about how we look at athletes like all these things that we talk about today are, were tied up in that. I mean, he he really like he he didn't do it himself, but that trial will always kind of be the epicenter of the change in the media culture for me. It was listen. We had my kids watch the thirty for thirty uh, yeah. on the Bronco chase. And they're like, we, we, we were trying to explain to him, my wife and I, well, here's what that day was like. And I remember yeah. where I was and, and, and all that moments they're like what? And then we played it. They watched it. And they got it a little bit about how mesmerizing a moment that was. And that was just the Bronco chase. And as your yeah. point, Jeff, the trial went on for a year, <sighs> went on for yeah. a year. Eric, yeah. what was your reaction? Everybody needs a friend like Al Cowlings. <laughs> um, <laughs> That was one. Norm McDonald, we like I wish I wish we could yeah, I wish it didn't take OJ dying for us to really appreciate Norm McDonald. Um and yeah, like a very unfortunate time. Um I feel like some of the be- OJ uh, Made in America was like one of the best documentaries I've ever yeah. seen. Um you know, I yeah, it was very transformative for our country in a weird way. Like I think I think at the time you didn't actually feel it that way. I mean, I was in grade school, but it, you know, in hindsight, Jeff, I think summed it up pretty, pretty, you know, pretty broadly. It's like it had an impact on a lot of different sectors of things. Man, well, obviously, obviously, race, you know, being the biggest too. Sure. Right, and and he had a complicated. I mean, from what I could tell, a very complicated relationship with both white people and black people. Like that, yeah. there were that was an interesting one with like the reactions there as well. And so it, it was, it was very, it had. Yeah, it was very much a, a cultural issue as well as far as uh, race relations. The helicopter following the chase, that was born. Yeah. That. I mean, maybe it had been done a little bit in L.A. Maybe yeah. it was a thing yeah. in other towns, but, like, it became the phenomenon. Every news organization had to have a helicopter to follow the police chase, and it all started on that day. It was, it, it, like, I don't know the intersection of him being Al Michaels' friend and, you know, all the different people that he knew that were Bob Costas, Bob Costas and the coverage, like guys, his coworkers having to cover that story. And it was, you know, he was a, he was a credibly talented football player, but a talented actor as well. Pitch man. I mean, it, it's, it's still surreal. Uh, right. I, I saw him in Vegas several years ago. Uh, he was eating by the way, dinner with someone who looked a lot like his former wife. Um, it was, he clearly had a type, yeah. but uh, let's, but it's still, there's not a, there's not been a story in the last, since that story happened that has created so much no. of a passion and response for people. There's still people who are like, 
you know, he did it right. Like people are still consumed by the fact that he got off, and you have to go to this whole thing about racial justice, justice versus for a black person versus a white school, white person back then, and what it meant. It's just like it's it's still so complex and drives so much so much passion. I mean, we have a like a former high profile politician who's on trial right now. And it probably is getting less attention adjusting for like all the yeah. different channels we have than the OJ trial, right? Like this, yep. th these things, it's crazy, right? Yeah, yeah. it is. I'm sure, I'm sure they were tight too back in the day. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, it, 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 I, nothing, there's never been a bigger, is it safe to say, never been a bigger story? No. You know, I, like, listen, America goes to war in Europe, in World War II, you, uh, you know, Japan bombs Pearl Harbor. Yes, I understand bigger, but from a, just a cultural yeah. phenomenon, and there was a death involved, two deaths involved, uh, but nothing sucked all the oxygen out of the room like that did. Yep, yep. consumed everybody. Still does. Yeah, still does. Still does. Uh, all right, great stuff, boys. Uh, remember, we're always brought to you by our friends at Gan Asphalt and Concrete. They're online at ganasphalt.com. Uh, anything and everything you need with a parking lot. They've been solving parking lot problems since 1994. 30 years in business, uh, they can help you with any and all problems you might have. Cut down on liability issues in your lot. Get it striped right today. Uh, whether it's concrete bumpers, signage, building the parking lot from scratch. They do it all. One contractor, all things parking lot. It's GAN Asphalt and Concrete online at GANASphalt.com. For Jeff Chadia from the NFL Network, Eric Eager from Super Sports. I'm Soren Petro saying thank you very much for joining us here on 2D NFL.